a mental hospital, and a control room. And how these places are beginning to merge into one big technoculture, in which machines outnumber humans by a thousand to one. And when I try to figure out how this began, I think back to the early wonder palaces, like Radio City Music Hall in New York. Now, Radio City was designed by a guy named Roxy, who was hired to build the ultimate theater of the future in the center of the center of the world, Rockefeller Center. And it was 1931, and the backers sent this guy to Europe to see some constructivist architecture for inspiration. But Roxy was just bored by all of this civilization. It just seemed so intellectual. And by the end of the trip, it was all a bit blur. And he hadn't got one single idea. So he's on his way back west. And he's on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic, thinking about all of this. And he's staring at the sunset. And suddenly, he has this vision. A sunset. The new theater of the new world should be shaped like a giant sunset. A place where the fun never sets. And so we built this colossal theatrical machine with animal elevators and a revolving stage and electric fly lines and a huge sound system and mics that retracted automatically into the proscenium. But the trouble with Radio City was that all the shows were flops. Vaudeville was all about facial expressions and slapstick timing and rapport with the audience. All of which was totally swallowed up in this enormous sunset. And what did work was the dance teams, known as the Roxyettes, later shortened to the Rockettes. And they worked perfectly. Radio City became a kind of theatrical spectacle that was about mechanization, precision, Synchronized machine made of women working in formation. A kind of big animated sex machine. A theater starring speed and technology. Now, 65 years later, techno theaters everywhere, entertainment centers, and colossal malls, and interactive arcades, and ride films and simulations and VR. Disneyfication of the world is in full swing. And in the last few months, it finally reached New York. Now, one of the reasons I moved to New York City in the first place was to escape malls. <laughs> I thought they would never get there. But Times Square has just been remodeled as a giant mall to make room for the six new Disney theaters featuring their version of all-American fun. Now, another part of the trend is theme parks. And for a few years now, I've been working on one with Peter Gabriel and Brian Eno called Real World. <laughs> and this project goes back to 1981. And it was Peter's dream to make a park that would give people a chance to experience three-dimensional sounds and images. And he picked a place near London, and he had it all planned. The park would be entirely underground. And you go into these cave-like spaces and put up what looked like giant hair dryers, the precursors of VR gear, and see holographic images and hear holophonic sound. And then over the next few years, he talked to hundreds of people about this idea, and it became an extremely ambitious project with lots of venues and cafes and large electronic theaters and lots and lots of rides. And one of the rides that Peter designed was called the River of Life. And this was a water ride that would take people around the seven stages of life in little boats. And we decided to ask several different artists to design each stage. So John Waters was going to design the adolescent stage. <laughs> And so the writers would move through all these pictures and smells, like being inside a John Waters movie. And you'd have the option of repeating stages or skipping them. 
Like it, you could relive your childhood endlessly. Or skip your midlife crisis completely. And at the end of the ride, you were dumped into a gene pool where you could decide whether to just dissolve or take on the karma generated by your actions during the ride and go again. <laughs> now at one point, the park was going to be in Tokyo. And we also were thinking of putting it on top of a mesa in New Mexico. And then finally, there was an offer from the mayor of Barcelona to put the park in the middle of his city. Now Barcelona, with its spooky, gaudy architecture, seemed the perfect place, sort of haunted. And the proposed site was near the university in a large, so-called, undeveloped area. And from here, there was a view of Tibidabo, Barcelona's oldest theme park, which was perched on top of a high bluff. It was built back in the late 19th century, and it's still this kind of favorite, almost magical spot. The kind of park with the huge, rickety wooden roller coaster and merry go rounds with crumbling, one-eyed wooden horses and carny barkers and caravans. And by the way, Tividabo got its name from the Latin. And this I give to you, or and all this will be yours. And these are the words the devil said to Jesus when he took him out to the 40 days in the wilderness to try to tempt him into the typical devil's tale. You do this for me, and I'll give all this to you. And he's pointing more or less right at our sight. Anyway, you enter real world through a gate flanked by two 60-foot freestanding tornadoes. There was going to be a big monorail and a TV station and a radio station and restaurants and a quiet club and a spherical dance club where dancers could control images with their feet. And we finally began to ask all of these designers and park experts to join us in our meetings to help us figure out how to realize these ideas. And these meetings were great. You know, you could say anything. You'd say things like, how about if a large black cloud hovers over the park and triggers a forest of talking trees? And some of these guys would actually write down, research a large black cloud for a talking tree forest. But the whole idea was to make a place designed by artists, a place about invention, rather than just another thrill space. I mean, it really seems like most theme parks are designed on the assumption that people are just so out of touch and totally anesthetized that they need to be spun around a few hundred times and dropped on their heads to feel anything at all. But the last time I visited the site in Barcelona, I went by myself to just sort of look around. And this land is covered with all this dense foliage. And from the outside, you can see the smoke from all these squatters' fires. And all the buildings are hidden under these very thick vines. And as I passed a thick bush, about 50 tiny hummingbirds fluttered out. And I thought to myself, great. We're going to come in here and chop everything down and put in a theme park. Good thinking. So at the moment, I'm thinking that some things are really better as ideas than reality. And the real world may just be one of these things. <laughs>